Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is February 23rd, 2012, and my guest is Emmanuel Derman of Columbia University. His latest book is Models Behaving Badly. Emmanuel, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks very much. I'm glad to be on. I want to start with your personal story. You began your career as a physicist and then went to Wall Street. Tell us about that journey. Yeah, I originally grew up in South Africa, and I um I like literature and, and, and the arts, but uh, really you had to specialize very young when you were in South Africa. It was like a British system. So when you were 16 or 17 and you went to college, that was it. You did arts or science or medicine or law or business. Um, and so I liked physics and I went into physics and um, I got very attracted to it. And I was um, inspired by all the famous physicists, just like everybody else, inspired by all the famous physicists. You read about Einstein and Schrodinger and... Um, so I did four years of physics in South Africa, and then I came to Columbia University, where I actually teach now, but I teach financial engineering, but I came to do a PhD in physics over there. And um, I did that. It took me a long time, seven years. Uh, I had the wrong kind of background. I had a very classical physics background, and Columbia was doing very, obviously, modern physics and quantum mechanics. And then I worked as a... I did a thesis on, on weak interactions on theoretical physics, and I... Uh, I worked as a postdoc and an assistant professor for seven years doing research and kind of liking it, but um, but also getting a bit discouraged at times. And why did you leave physics? And, uh, and where did you go? You know, I, I started out, I graduated from Columbia, and I had it was very difficult to get jobs. Uh, Hatfield McGovern Amendment at the end of the Vietnam War um, passed, and a lot of the physics jobs in academic life, even the theoretical ones, were being funded by the Department of Defense, and um, suddenly there were no jobs, and I had a two-year, no permanent jobs, and even even temporary jobs you were lucky to get, so I had a two-year postdoc at University of Pennsylvania, and then I had a two-year postdoc at Oxford in England in theoretical physics, and then I had a two-year postdoc at Rockefeller University back in New York, and my wife and I were both in academic life and juggling being in different parts of the world, and then I had a, I got a, a tenure-track assistant professor job at Boulder, Colorado. And I went there, but my wife couldn't get a job there. And we had a two-year-old kid already, and um, life got complicated. And that was, I want to say, nominally why I left physics, although in a way I was also getting a little kind of discouraged. Physics is very difficult and very appealing at the same time. And after a while, um, unless you're really, really good, you feel like you're no good at all. Uh, that's not uncommon, I think, in many fields, but I think it's particularly true in physics because you feel like, <clears throat> as a friend of mine once described, you're just slicing the salami. You're not really uh, extending the that, that's anything. A good metaphor. Yes, you're. You're. There are people doing one. You, you run into people who um, whose papers you can maybe understand, but you know you could you could never do anything like that. It's, yeah, it's so even if you're smart. So yeah. how how did you go from that? So you're thinking, well, this I wish this could I wish this were better. How, how do you go from that to being on Wall Street? How did that happen? Um, well, in two steps. First, I wanted to move back to New York where my wife was still working and where my son and my wife were. And um, and so I, at that time, the, w- what Wall Street is to physicists for the last 20 years, <clears throat> in 1980, it was um, telecommunications and, and energy. It was the energy crisis. And, and although actually... Bell Labs was hiring a lot of ex-physicists and so-called rocket scientists to do business research. And um, I ran into some people from there. I'd known some other physicists who went there, and um, I got a job at Murray Hill in a, in a business analysis system center um, using ex-physicists and computer scientists and people to sort of do, I won't even say do financial modeling, maybe do financial modeling and then build financial modeling tools for people at AT&T headquarters. And I did that for five years. Um, that was sort of a big shock to my system, actually, because I was used to being in academic life yeah. where you think you're your own boss and you can do whatever you like. And suddenly I was in this sort of industrial complex where 
everybody had a supervisor and every supervisor had a department head and every department head had a I forget what. Yeah. Um, and but somehow, but somehow you end up at Goldman Sachs. Yeah, and then well, yeah, I end up at Goldman Sachs because I actually I learned a vast amount of useful stuff at Bell Labs, but I really, maybe to my detriment, I hated it. I took I took the authority over me very seriously in those days, and and yeah, um, you were and spoiled. I was spoiled. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's an academic thing. I don't yeah. know. I was I was definitely spoiled. Um, and I always wanted to get out of there, although I actually learned a lot of very useful stuff. And I kept thinking, should I go back to physics or should I leap all the way out? And um, eventually, Wall Street came knocking on people's doors and, and I went all the way out, although it took me like five years to sort of, well, the first three years I didn't even think about it. And then it took me like two years to decide to go. So when, what year roughly did you go to Wall Street? I went to Wall Street in the end of 85. Yeah. I'd actually been offered a job there about a year before and turned it down because um yeah uh, and how long how long did you stay i stayed on wall street from 1985 to 2002 long time and i still actually work part-time at a fund of funds called prisma capital partners run by some ex-goldman people in new york i usually work there on fridays so when you were at goldman you actually were there during the transition from i think correct me if i'm wrong from being a partnership to a publicly traded company. Yes. I came there in 85. Um, I actually worked at Salomon for one year in 89, and then I went back to Goldman. And I was there until 2002, and they went public, um, I don't know, maybe 1999. Yeah, or late 90s. Like now, I'm just curious because it's an issue that I'm intrigued by. Did you notice any changes in yeah, the company very, from that? Very, um, yes, very marked, although – um, although some of it had to do with growing in size and then some of it had to do with going public. But, but um, yeah, I always think I always think it's, I don't know if it's sad, but, well, Go Goldman, I think they felt the obligation to go public because they thought they were, as a private partnership, up against um, all the big commercial banks which could make low-interest loans to people in order to get business and not have to mark them to market, whereas Goldman had to mark those things to market. And um, and so I always felt a short uh, a shortness of capital. And um, in 1994, they had a lot of partners leave when the fixed income world had a very bad turn. And um, and I think they got scared, so they went public. But I think the firm did change. It got much bigger. It got, I would say, internally more secretive um, and less congenial. And I think it was a very well run. Probably still is a very well run firm. But it was a very well run firm because there were partners seated all over the place who suppressed, for lack of a better word, sociopathic behavior. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I, because they, their capital is going to be locked, locked up in there for 20 years. Even if, they, even if they retire, they had to leave their capital there. And so the place actually functioned, functioned very, um, very well. And, and there was also, so there was one thing that changed, um, was that they weren't playing with other people's money. They were playing with their own money. And yeah. that's always a, a big sort of sanity, sanity contributor. Yeah. And um, there was something else. I can't remember what I was going to say. Yeah, um, but that's the thing I'm interested. In. I mean, when you go from a world, it's true. It's it's nice to be highly leveraged. I think it was hard to be leveraged when you were a private partnership, and the publicness allowed them to borrow more than they otherwise would have, which made them more risk taking. I think. Yeah, yeah. Although they had episodes before, I think in the mid '90s, before they went public, when they went through periods of taking. Sort of having hedge, internal hedge fund like groups, but um, but yeah, they were always trying to raise money from. They had money from I forget. There's some Hawaiian um Hawaiian schools, wealthy um endowment. They they would and they had money from them and from Sumitomo because they were always short of capital. Uh huh. And so they sold it by going public. But yeah, seems like it seems a like a good thing. Always being short of capital. Yeah, yeah. The alternative, always having plenty, is a uh, not a healthy situation. Maybe I, I agree with you. <laughs> So in your book, you talk uh, at length and very in very interesting ways across science, philosophy, economics, and finance about the distinction between theories and models. Those are two words that we often use interchangeably to mean um, our attempt to understand the world. But you make a nice distinction between them. Explain the distinction and talk about the differences between uh, – theories and models in science and, and in the social sciences? 
things I'd like to... I came to that... I mean, it's my use of the word somewhat, although I like them. I mean, everybody has a slightly different definition of theory and models. And I did use to equate them. I used to, a long time ago, talk about fundamental models and more phenomenological models, which just try to describe the world but aren't fundamental. But eventually I, I decided I like the distinction between theory and models. And to me, models are kind of a... Well, let me start with theories. To me, theories are really attempts to... Um, successful or unsuccessful attempts to describe the world the way it really is. They're kind of descriptive, and they look at the world. And so, for example, if I were to take Newton's laws, um, you know, it says force equals mass times acceleration, and um, and the inverse square law of gravity. And those are descriptions of the world that are theoretically framed in mathematics, but they're not an analogy. They're trying to describe the way things actually work. And they're not an approximation. Except under various situations, but yeah, they're, they're not they're not an approximation, and um, they're not uh, almost like although they they might not be dead right. I mean, I think sort of Freud is a theory, or or I mentioned in my book, or I won't go into that. I think Spinoza's theory of emotions is a theory because it doesn't rely on analogies. It doesn't have to be correct, but its aim is to describe things as they are. Um, and a model. And a model. Uh, sort of came to the conclusion while I was writing my book was really much more of a metaphor and was an attempt to find an analogy between something you want to understand and something you really do understand either heuristically or by a theory. So um, I have an example in my book. There's a quote by Schopenhauer where he says, uh, uh, a very pretty metaphor where he says, um, sleep is, uh, I'm going to have a hard time remembering it now. Yeah, it's a very. Uh, I'll I'll riff for a minute. If you have the book nearby, you can. Yes, you can, I can you pull can it out. For it, it's one of my favorite. It's uh, a haunting. Um, I, I found it a very haunting quote uh, to think about because what what he was dealing with there is is evil the absence of good or is evil the uh, its own entity? Is darkness? The absence of light, or is there really something called darkness? Is death just the absence of life, or is death is vivid? And life is the thing that's that's sort of temporary or otherwise. Those are the issues I remember. Yeah, I wrote a – I'm just finding it here. I wrote a big section about, yeah, presence and absence. And I'm, I'm just trying to find his quote here. Here it is. I had to pull out my book. He says, sleep is the interest we have to pay on the capital, which is called in a death. And the higher the rate of interest and the more regularly it is paid – the further the date of redemption is postponed. I actually have no idea where I came across that a couple of years ago. I can't remember anymore. But what he's doing is he's comparing, he's looking at sleep and saying one of the characteristics of sleep is that um, it happens periodically every night. And one of the characteristics of, of bonds is that you owe interest on them and you pay them every month or every six months. And based on the analogy between the, the similarity of the two periodicities, he then says, since, um, you pay interest because you once borrowed money and you eventually have to pay it back. In the same way, you go to sleep at night and subject yourself to darkness because you once borrowed your life from the darkness and you have to give it back at the end. And, and that's, um, a, that's a metaphor. So it's, it's a metaphor. <laughs> and, but, he's, but, he's sort of, but it's based on a limited analogy, which is the periodicity of coupons and sleep. And then he's extending it or sort of analy- analytically continuing it in a mathematical way to say something about sleep and life um, by comparison. And I think models are like that. I, I was going to talk about the efficient market model later, but I think that's similar in that um, y- y- you sort of say stock prices or the returns on stock prices behave like smoke diffusing. And there's something similar about them, but it's not an accurate description in the way that, say, Newton's laws attempt to be an accurate description. It's really based on an analogy to something you do understand, which is smoke diffusing and saying, well, maybe stock prices behave a lot like that. And it helps you. I mean, models are useful because they, they can, if they're if the analogy is, is accurate enough, they can help you get at the intuition of, of what's going on. Um, I, while you were, when I was reading those sections, I was thinking about macroeconomics, uh, which you, you touch on very briefly in the book. You mainly focus on finance, but you mention economic models, and I think about them way too much. But obviously, um, there's no such thing as aggregate demand. Uh, it's a conceptual idea to help us try to understand uh, our myriad of inter- 
connected interactions as buyers, sellers, employers, employees, investors, et cetera. And it may be a useful metaphor. It may not be. Um, but it has a black box quality. In a theory, you're getting at the mechanics of the black box is, yes, is the way I think I, of it. I agree with you. In you know, fact, thing, I like what oh, – no, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I like what you said about aggregate demand because I read something by Hayek once um, where he said that um, – I'm paraphrasing, but in, in the physical sciences, what you really understand are macroscopic concepts like pressure and volume and temperature and, and tension and stuff like that. And then you deduce from them the existence of atoms, which you never see, but which explain those things. And he then, I think he then sort of points out that macroeconomic things like supply and demand and, um, and liquidity are really not things that you observe. They're the metaphors. What you really observe are the individual people. You know, so you actually, it's the atoms that are real, and the other things that are more, um, more metaphorical. Yeah, it's true. I think that's that's absolutely. And so right. he thinks people are sort of, you know, he sort of said theoreticians were going in the wrong direction in economics by trying to mimic the direction of of physics. You know, going from the large to the small. Yeah, and I, that's obviously an ongoing debate. That's. Not not settled. Yeah. Um, the the other part of of this section of your book, which I found um, utterly beautiful and fascinating, is and I, I, correct me if I'm wrong. I think I read it in your book. Uh, I've been reading some other things as well, but it's sort of the order of theory and empirical evidence. You say at one point that Newton saw the way the world worked, and then then he did some experiments to. To confirm it, he he didn't do a bunch of experiments, noodle around with the data, and then think, well, there seems to be a relationship here. He actually saw the answer, saw the theory, and then he had to confirm it. It might not turn out to be true, but but the the flash of insight came first. Is that is that what what you? Yeah, wrote? that is what I wrote. Um, a little bit about Newton and a lot more about Ampere and Maxwell. I have one chapter about the history of electrom of electromagnetism and comparing it to the history of the efficient market model and trying to explain exactly what you said, that um, there's a succession of physicists who make great descriptive discoveries like Newton's laws or Ampere's law of electromagnetism or Maxwell's equations, and each one of them is recursively amazed by the fact that the person that came before them could, deduce, could, could claim to deduce this law from experiment because it looks to them like they must have thought up the law first and then checked that it confirms experiment. And sometimes that's true because there's a faith almost in the underlying mathematics that implies something that has to be there even though you can't see it or we don't have the measurement tools, but eventually it's found. And that's an unbelievable aspect of physics. Yeah, and, and um, yeah, a lot of things. I'm, I'm, I'm a big – I don't know fan the wrong word, but um, I think people underplay the role of sort of creative and artistic intuition in all of these discoveries in economics and in physics and in mathematics. In mathematics, I think people understand it. But um, yeah, I, I was sort of I was reading a bit of Kahneman's book on on um, on fast and slow thinking. Yeah, and he points out all the errors in fast thinking. But I'm sort of a fan of it, equating that roughly with intuition. I'm still sort of a fan of intuition in that I think observation at some point there has to be some leap which comes from somewhere unknown. And I think the thing that fascinates me is you know we don't understand that, and I and I think. Even more importantly, the people who make the leap don't understand it. There's this wonderful description by Andrew Wiles of when he, having proved Fermat's last theorem, finds out that his proof is wrong. He spent seven years proving it. Huh. He's He proves it. It's on the front page of the New York Times, and then someone finds an error in the proof, and it's back to the drawing board, and he spends 18 months. And in those 18 months, he must be in total despair most of the time. Yeah, it sounds like it. And at one point, he looks, he says it was, I think he said it was Saturday morning. He's looking at it, he's sitting at his desk. He's looking at this equation he's been looking at for probably eight years. And all of a sudden, he says, I just saw it. I just, it's not like, oh, you know, he did all this work and dug this ditch and then the water flowed in and it just something in, inexplicable, miraculous, really. Just, he, he saw it and yeah. he, he didn't see it before. Can't explain how he saw it. Um, it's an amazing thing. Yeah, I've, I've, yeah, and that's what I wrote in my book about Kepler, Newton, Ampere, um, Maxwell, Einstein, who all sort of do something like that. And everybody says, everybody who writes about them, in fact, Ampere's paper is called like Deduction of the Laws of Electromagnetism from, from Observation. And Maxwell and Poincare say there's no way he could have done experiments to, to 
deduce these laws. You so, know, you had to know, you had to sort of intuit the law and then and then confirm it. And it's that there's that story I've mentioned it before on the program where Einstein is theories confirmed by the bending of the light of a star by the sun during yeah. an eclipse. And when asked whether what he would have done if it had been proved wrong, he said, "Well, I wouldn't believe the experiment because I, <laughs> I know my theory is right." And in, in that respect, I just saw today on the internet that this um, this there's now apparently a flaw. There were these people at CERN who claimed that neutrinos travel faster than light. Right. And there's now some report on on some website today saying that their GPS system was connected by a faulty wire. To, oh no! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's a 60 millisecond gap there. It's not proved yet, but there's definitely a mistake there. Well, truth is elusive, and of course, yeah. we're all overly confident in our theories, but sometimes they're right. Yeah. And Einstein's right more often than the rest of us most of the time. Definitely. So, but let's move on to models. Okay. So, so we have theories which are testable and and can often confirmed that they may not be perfect they they may need tweaking but they're trying to get at the way that the world is and then we have models that try to get at sort of the, the way I understand your idea the underlying intuition of the of what's happening based on an intuition we understand from somewhere else yes and um and and it's usually my claim is it's when it's a model it's usually only a partial mapping between the thing you're interested in and the thing you want to understand and the thing you're trying to compare it to. And so you're trying to get, in fact, if I get pedantic, um, I read, I read some history of Maxwell when I was doing this and he eventually came up with Maxwell's equations, which are just mathematics and describe electricity and magnetism. But he actually proceeded by first building a bunch of metaphorical models, which in which he thought of, um, he thought of, um, electric li and magnetic lines of force as fluid flow, which, which they, resembled but weren't identical to. And he, he actually says very categorically, I'm trying to get some intuition and I want to build a model. I don't believe it, but I want to see what I can extract from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Irving Fisher, the economist of the early part of the 20th century, yeah. used hydraulics, uh, the, ah. the flow of water. I, I, I don't know which book it was in. I'll, I'll try to find it for huh, the, for the like links. But he's got a book where he has these complex hydraulic models, f water flowing through pipes and and into basins, and it's supposed to capture something about liquidity and interest rates. They're, you know, the level of the water is analogous huh. to the – and it, they're beautiful. They're really interesting. But yeah. everyone knows that that the that financial markets are not bathtubs. They may be like bathtubs in some yes. dimension, but they're not bathtubs. <laughs> yes. And that can, that can lead you astray. Yeah, Jeremy <laughs> Bernstein, who's a physicist that I know, gave me a quote that I use in my book, which he says – I think it comes from maybe from Herbert Simon, but I'm not sure. I can't remember now. But he says he has a drawing of a bird, and he says this looks like a bird, but no bird looks like this. Yeah, that's that's right. So let's talk about the models in finance, uh, particularly uh, ones that you worked with for that long period of time on Wall Street. Uh, we recently, I recently interviewed uh, Eugene Fama, who's associated with the efficient markets. Yes. Um, hypothesis. Uh, then you also talk about Black-Scholes and you talk about CAPM. So let's talk about each of those in turn, if, if you would, what you like about them and what, you, what you're not so crazy about. Okay. Well, efficient market model, it seems to me everybody has a slightly different definition of what they mean. Um, I know um, Burton Melchior reviewed my book in the Wall Street Journal and he liked it generally. And he was sort of complimentary, but he, he claims in one paragraph that I was putting too much weight, he, he sort of claimed that all the efficient market model says is, I don't know what's going to happen next, as opposed to saying that current prices are right. So, well, the not, first claim is a modest claim. <laughs> yes, it is a modest claim. I, and I think maybe he's, maybe he's technic, technically correct, but I think in everyday parlance, people, people describe to a stronger version of it. Yeah, the way you describe, I think the way you wrote it in the book is that prices reflect all Available, All available public, publicly available information. Yes. It's an attractive idea. It is. It's there's very something pretty to it, and, and there's and something to it. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, and I'm always, I'm getting off topic a little bit, I'm always a little bit dis disappointed by what's happened in behavioral finance and economics because whatever people do, it's sort of interesting in a small way, but it doesn't seem to have the overall breadth that the whole efficient market aspiration of the model had. Um, so... I, I like the model, but when people put it into practice, and here I'm thinking of CAPM, 
they assume geometric Brownian motion for stock moves, and um, and and so I think what's wrong with it. I think it's probably right in some sense that, or at least defensible that current stock prices reflect all available information. But I think I think the bad, the faulty part of the model is is saying that stock prices satisfy geometric stock returns satisfy geometric Brownian motion and that risk is this well-defined thing that you can capture by just giving a, a, a standard deviation or a volatility. Yeah. And you know, it, it, it's, got the, it's got the qualities of something risky, which is nice, but it doesn't have all the attributes of real-world risk. And, and uh, going back to Hayek, it's, it's using, say, Brownian motion or other high-level mathematical concepts to fancy up uh, – the the model is um, scientism, not science. It, yes. it it gives the patina of science. Uh, I like the Gilbert and Sullivan quote. It gives the it gives verisimilitude to what is other to an otherwise bald and unconvincing narrative. <laughs> so it it gussies yeah. it up and makes it look fancy, but maybe it isn't true. Yeah, and I think it's kind of a valiant a valiant effort. <laughs> um, and everybody, yeah, I don't agree with Nassim Taleb. I think everybody who invented these things. Deserves whatever Nobel prizes they got. Um, you know, I don't think I don't think it's. Uh, but but at the same time, it's the real world is much more complicated than the real world of human beings and stock returns and markets is much more complicated than than can be captured in saying stocks. You know, stocks risk is captured by their standard deviation. But the, I think the plus side of it, and and again, there's a big difference between how I use efficient market hypothesis and how Wall Street people use it. But for me, it's when somebody says, hey, I've got a great idea for a stock because I saw there, that this company just invented blah, blah, blah. I always say, you know, I say it's too late. Now, it's possible it's not too late. Maybe the price hasn't already risen. But, you know, as a uh, inducer of um, caution, it's a very effective uh, idea. And I think it's a very powerful idea where, where it seems to go wrong, of course, is that sometimes – Things act in ways that we don't expect, that arbitrage conditions don't always hold every instant, and th there's often psychology that, that intervenes in ways that make markets work a little differently than we expect. Yeah, and, and yeah, exactly. And stocks, stocks jump, people get panicky, um, there's contagion. Um, none of, all, all of that sort of violates, violates the strict mathematical assumptions you know, behind the efficient market model. And that may mean there's money to be made that wouldn't otherwise be available, but the odds that you're going to make it maybe still be very small, which again yeah. I th is why I think it's a good sobering thing to keep in mind. But the the, the other two models um, are, are are more complicated, and, and you spend a lot of time on Black Scholes. Talk about what Black Scholes tries to do. Yeah, it's I, I like, complicated. I, I've oscillated over the years. I was sort of amazed by Black Scholes when I first saw it, and then for a while. Ten years ago, I thought maybe it wasn't that good, but I've sort of come around to thinking that it's really, it really is admirable. And and the way Black and Scholes originally derived it, the, the derivation you always read now is the very technical stochastic calculus one. But the way they originally derived it was by saying qualitatively that the sharp ratio of the stock and the sharp the sharp ratio of an option and the sharp ratio of the underlying stock that the option is written on has to be the same, which is saying that the excess return per unit of risk for both of them should be the same when, when the market's in equilibrium. And I think that's a completely reasonable statement. You're saying the option and the stock have the same underlying source of riskiness. And if you use one or the other, if everybody's sensible, then you'll get the same excess return per unit of risk, whichever one you, you, um, whichever one you decide to employ. So back up a little bit. Talk, talk about – first explain what an option is. Okay. Well, and, then, and then you can try to get to the sharp ratio without a blackboard, but you might not be able to do that. But okay, you can, no, the I, intuition I, I can will work. try. Yeah, go, um, go ahead. So, so everybody knows what a stock is, and a stock price can go up or down at any instant, and nobody generally knows which way it's going to go. So an option is a derivative or contingent contract on a stock – and for example, a call option says you only you, you pay for a contract that only gives you the upside but not the downside. So if the stock goes up, you make a dollar for every dollar that the stock goes up eventually. But if the stock goes down, you don't lose anything. 
And so it's a... It's so you have a, to pay for that privilege. And you pay for that privilege. And the big puzzle of the um, prior to Black Shoals was how, how much should you pay for something that's got this asymmetric sort of upside risk but no downside risk in this case. And um, and what Black and Shoals came up with from my point of view of looking at was saying... Um, you can, you ah, it's tricky, but you can. Well, the source of risk for both the option and the stock is the same, but the mathematical characteristics are different because the one is only upside and the other has symmetric risk. And you can you can find the risk of the option in terms of the risk of the stock mathematically. So, in think about it without again without the math, if if the stock price goes up, I make I make money if I hold the stock. If the stock price goes up, I make money with the option. Yes. If the stock price goes down, I lose money, but not with the option. So there's got to be a value to that. They both have risk because because in they, in both cases the stock could go down. In which case you lose. In the case of the option, you lose what you paid for it. You you forfeit that, but you don't lose more than that. And so that that obviously the the value of those two things has to be interconnected, and that's what this tries to calculate, right? Yes, and and. They're and yeah, trying not to be mathematical. Although I have to think a little bit more about how to say it. But but Black and Scholes show that if you borrow money and buy the stock, you can sort of create something that's very much like the option for a moment. And and they um, which is very clever. That's the clever part. That's the clever part. So that, that's so sort of I like to separate the science and engineering. The science is. The ostensible science is defining what the risk of a stock is like and the geometric Brownian motion, and that's scientific, but it's not accurate. The theory's wrong, it's a, or the model's wrong. It's not a real description of the world. But then the second idea is our engineering idea, which is that you can create the risk of an option by borrowing money and buying the stock. That's, that's a very great idea, and, and they sort of building a recipe for creating an option um, for, for creating the risk of an option out of borrowing money and buying a stock, and um, and that's the sort of engineering um, engineering modeling idea, and um, and I think that's completely right. The only and and everything they derive after that is right if you assume geometric Brownian motion, but it's the geometric Brownian motion, the risk of the stock that's badly modeled in the efficient market model. I have to say, the part I find strange about this, not being a finance person, is the focus of Wall Street on. On getting the right price, we don't do that anywhere else <laughs> in the economy. And if, if you hadn't, if if it was a long time ago and we hadn't had this scientific, so-called scientific revolution in mathematical finance yeah. and financial engineering, if you said to me, "What's the price of an op- What's the right price of the option?" I said, "Well, sell it, put it on the market, see what people pay for it. That's the right price. That's how we price everything else in the world. We don't we don't say you give the example. It's a nice example of apartment buildings. We don't say, well." This apartment has so many square feet. It's so many miles from from this um, uh, subway station, and it's got this school district. So therefore, the right price is is twenty three hundred dollars a month. And if we, if somebody says, "Well, I'll pay twenty four hundred," we don't say, "Well, you're a fool." It's only worth twenty three. We say, "Well, if that's what people value it at," because we don't pretend to have scientific weights on on the attributes of the apartment. We understand that it has something to do with square footage and something to do with location, but but we don't pretend to try to. Weight those because we never want weights them differently, and similarly with financial products, people weight risk differently. Of course, they can diversify some of it away, and I think maybe this is your point that, but you can't diversify all of it away. And to pretend that you can, to pretend you can create a portfolio of of something that's quote the same when it's not quite the same is maybe an illusion. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I don't know. I mean, I, I wish I knew more economics. Actually, one day off the interview, you could tell me what's. It sounds like the right person to tell me what's a good way to get educated in economics. You just have to listen every Monday morning, Emmanuel. It's the econ talk comes out every Monday. Just every Monday, okay. an hour a week, and in I don't know, two or three years, you'll be a genius. Okay, like, like oh, my well, other listeners. It's right, funny. Guys? I started out. <laughs> well, I still don't know much about economics, but I sort of learned everything the wrong way around. I learned finance first and economics later, and I'd really like to learn more economics now. It seems to have more more. More important. <laughs> well, yeah, it's a lot of people. I think feel the same way. It's yeah. like maybe we ought to pay a little attention to it. Um, of course, a little learning is a dangerous thing, uh, as Pope said. But uh, let's, you said that is that Pope? Yeah, it's Alexander Pope. Huh, I didn't um, know that. He said a little learning is a dangerous thing. Taste not or drink deep from the Pyrian spring. The Pyrian spring was the source of yeah. wisdom. So either 
drink a lot or don't drink. Don't pretend you're an expert when you've only had a little bit of drinking, but uh, a little bit of knowledge. Um, <laughs> so let's talk briefly about CAPM. CAPM is an attempt to extend some of the insights of pricing to a, a wider range of stuff. Try it, give it a shot. Yeah, so so um, I start with efficient markets coming first, meaning that um, that you don't know whether stocks are going to go up or down, and therefore, um, and therefore, um, you, you, the simplest model is this model of Brownian motion, where stocks can stock prices can diffuse somewhat like smoke diffusing from the tip of a cigarette, and then Sharp and um, and Lintner and um, suddenly the name of Fisher's collaborator is slipping me. A um, trainer, of, uh-huh. um, come up in various versions with CAPM, which the way I like to look at it is. Um, they're saying that um, you should only get paid for taking risk that you have to take. And any risk you can diversify away or hedge away, you shouldn't get paid for because you didn't have to take it. It's only, it's only absolutely obligatory risk that you should get paid for. And then they analyze um, how you can diversify, how you can diversify, um, diversify away risk or hedge away risk. And end up with a, a price for the, the the only the only risk you can't get rid of is the whole market's risk because all the risk of individual stocks you can get rid of by putting together a big portfolio where the risks mostly cancel out, and um, they come up with a formula that relates the expected return of a stock to the expected return of the market. And what um, turns out to be important is some stocks are very correlated with the market; they move up when the market goes up in lockstep, and others don't move that way and so yes, so different. it depends on on their correlation, their beta to the market, as as finance professionals call it, and 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 Black Scholes is actually Fisher Black was very in love with the whole Cap M argument, and he just applied Cap M to options and derived the Black Scholes model, which is what I was explaining imperfectly before, but but I think Black Scholes is much better than Cap M. Although it's based on the same idea, because different stocks really have such different risk characteristics that the assumptions of geometric Brownian motion and the assumptions in CAPM don't hold very well for individual stocks. Whereas when you and so I think the model's much more flawed. Whereas when you apply it to options, you're saying a stock and the option on top of it have to have the same the same bang per unit of buck or the same return per unit of risk and you're talking about a much more confined world with a stock and an option than you than you are when you're talking about cap M, which refers to all the stocks in the universe. Yeah, well, Am I Black making Scholes, sense? I'm not sure. Yeah, no, Black Scholes isn't as ambitious, right? And that's no fun. So let's we got. <laughs> but it's it's much more. So yeah, in fact, in fact, one of the one of the yeah, that, that's a very good way you put it. That it isn't as ambitious and it's actually able to go a lot farther. And the same sort of true of I think fixed income. Fixed income financial engineering or quantitative finance compared to equities, because because fixed income instruments have regular coupons and have a much more mathematical behavior. You can write down much more truer things about them than you can for stocks, where anything goes. Yeah, and um, it's hard not to, as Nassim Taleb says, uh, it's hard not to extend your scientific knowledge into areas where it may not be as applicable. <laughs> but it, you, you just yeah. it's hard to fight that urge. Um, it, at the end of the book, you, you talk about the crisis uh, that we're still in the middle of, and you say that you were unsurprised uh, by the uh, meltdown in some dimension. Uh, so for, talk about that. You say you weren't surprised that economics didn't do so well and finance didn't do so well that the – for example, you don't mention it specifically in this book, but the, the value at risk models that people were using that attempted to – Look at the riskiness of an investment house's overall portfolio. They were they turned out to be ghastly and incorrect. Uh, you say you're not surprised. You're not surprised by that. Why not? Um, I'm I'm not surprised. I think there was a time when I would have been surprised when I first came to finance in 1985 from physics. I only saw the similarities between between finance or mathematical finance and physics, and I really imagined, as I said in my first book, that you could write down some grand unified theory of finance, you know, and, and everything would work just the way it did in physics. But over the years, I got to realize that financial models, and they are mostly models, not theories, um, are really uh, are, are really 
um, they really glorified ways of interpolation, and I don't mean that in a bad sense, but what they do is they take, they, they take some analogy between financial markets and smoke or, or hydraulics or, or something that you understand better, and then apply that and, um, and, um, and make predictions on the basis of it. And it works in a very narrow range when the world doesn't change too much. But when the world undergoes a crisis, your model is fundamentally wrong and inapplicable, and, um, and all bets are off. All the assumptions you make about, um, about individual prices being independent of what everybody else in the whole wider world does and having a reservoir of a market, all of that, all of that just drops away when people get panicky. And your whole interpolation mechanism based on some analogy breaks down when you have big moves happening. I think all of these models only work as long as you stay close to the, close to the regime you started out in. Yeah, and of course, it's an even simpler model during those placid times. That, that model is tomorrow's going to be like today and today is like yesterday. You don't, you don't need all the firepower that, that these models typically bring. And then what you want the firepower for is when you have a big change. And, of course, they don't apply so well. That's when they don't work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think about that a lot when I think about the Keynesian multiplier. You know, we, we typically – we've got all these time series models in economics. We're estimating relationships. They're very stable. And then all of a sudden, they don't hold, uh, and the model isn't useful anymore. Yeah, I'm always amazed when I read the on the internet the battles between between different camps of economists about the effect of the multiplier and how big it'll be, and nobody really seems to agree. Well, it's difficult when you can't verify it. I mean, yeah. that's my biggest my, the biggest thing I think I've learned about macroeconomics since the crisis started and thinking about it in a scientific framework or trying to. And the reason I don't think economics is a science is that it's one thing to say your predictions aren't very accurate. It's another thing to say that you can't verify them. So when people say that you know the stimulus created 3.3 million jobs, how would you know? It's, yeah. an, it's an interesting idea. Yeah. But there's no independent way to verify whether the prediction is accurate other than the mo same model you used. So the analogy I use, you know, it's like saying we're sending a rocket to Mars – uh, when it should be halfway there, you're asked, is it, is it going to end up there? Well, sure, my model predicts that it will. And then when it's supposed to land there, you say, well, where is it? You say, well, it's there because my model said that's where it's going. But you still, if you can't see Mars and you can't get a broadcast back from the, from the ship, you're, you're fooling yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very well put. I actually, I, I always sort of, in retrospect, admire Fisher Black. I was trying to find this quote as you were saying that and it reminded me where you sort of understood that um that models were were not reality and I'm just trying to see if I can find this quote he says somewhere I'm searching on my on my uh I'm searching he 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 says um I think I've got it here he says something about um he's going to build a model and he's going to rely on stylized facts and introspection because yeah. he sort of understands that you're you're trying to come up with something plausible well, that's what we do in economics. Yeah. So, Here he says, uh, oh, no, sorry, this is actually Newton that I've got here, quoting, uh, Keynes quoting Newton. Actually, Keynes was a big fan of Newton, and Keynes was the guy who said that Newton, um, Newton, Newton had this great intuition more than anything else. It reminds me of, uh, who was it? Um, I want to say it was Alfred Marshall. Maybe it was Keynes or Marshall. That, you know, he had these, these great results and, and – Somebody said uh, he hid the tools that did the work. Oh, oh. and and I think uh, it's, maybe it's not Marshall. I'll, have to, I'll see if I can find it. But that's okay. It's the that's same very idea. similar to what I was saying. What um, what uh, what uh, Maxwell said yeah. about Ampere. Right. Sure. It's sort of people. Murray Gilman has some quote about it, relating it to some kind of French cooking in which you bake something between I don't know slabs of pork, but then remove the pork afterwards, <laughs> and so you only get the taste. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was saying what what sort of shocked me more was um, was um, the breakdown of what I thought of as like capitalist morals somehow. Yeah, talk about that. Yeah, somehow I always I don't want to say justified, but I always sort of thought that capitalism is kind of a little brutal, but but it's it's symmetric that you know you you make money if you take risk, and it takes human ingenuity and human endeavor to take risk, and that's what the stock market runs on. But that um, if you want to get the upside, you have to have the downside. And what was sort of horrifying for me during the last four years was seeing how um, how some people got 
had gotten the upside and always said, you know, praise risk, big corporations. And then they ran begging for government help and got government help when, um, when they were bailed out by taxpayers, essentially. And other people weren't bailed out. It's Excuse a very, me? It's a very, it was a very asymmetric system. House people who bought – who borrowed a lot of money to buy a house they couldn't afford, they're struggling. Yeah. But the people on large institutions that borrowed a lot of money to buy assets that weren't worth very much, they – the lenders got all their money back. Yeah, it's a total – it's a total mystery to me. And I used to argue with friends about it and they would all say, well, you want to just punish them and destroy the whole – you know, the whole world in order to, to wreak revenge. And I don't know how close we came to destroying the whole – well, I mean, the, the, the economic world does run on credit. I sort of more and more understand. But nevertheless, I think it's a terrible example to see people um, or corporations be saved, but literally saved from death by taxpayers and go back to record profits the next year. Yeah, well, it's not a matter of vengeance. It's a matter of the cost of those incentives. You know, it's not – I don't want to punish them. There's no evil when you make bad decisions, but if you – Reward bad decisions, you get more of them. Uh, that's the part I find deeply troubling. You mean if you, if you allow people to get away with them? Yeah, it's not yeah. that I want to see General Motors or or uh, AIG punished. Yeah, but I don't want to see them rewarded. Yeah, no, <laughs> I'm 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 exactly the yeah. same. I uh, I quite can't quite believe it. What are your um? Did you have any conversations with former colleagues about that? And at and, Goldman, you mean? Yeah. No, I've really been gone for ten years, so um, not not really. Um, most of the people I know I know are gone, but I think I, I ran into people around the time that Goldman and Morgan um, um, got access to the Fed window. You know, yeah. and became commercial banks, and I think people were really scared at the time. They were. You know, I, I mean, it was a race to the bottom to see whose stock was going to be, you know, gotten rid of next, and they were heading for the bottom when when they were safe because it's sort of like like. Everybody thinks there's only price risk, but all of these places have terrible funding, you know, overnight funding risk. And that's what, I mean, I think Goldman didn't own trash the way, say, Merrill or Lehman did, but um, but nobody's going to lend them money anymore. But they created that world. They chose to live in that world. Yeah, yeah, right? and I think... I that think, overnight funding risk is a crazy way to run a business. It, it's the same thing we were talking about before. If everything is going fine, it makes total sense to lend enormous sums of money overnight on assets that yeah. seem to be worth something. If they turn out not to be worth something, all of a sudden people start getting uneasy. I think people were aware that that could happen, but they didn't bother planning for an, an alternative strategy or an insurance plan because they figured if the whole thing melted down, they'd all be taken care of, and they were. Yeah, most, no, most I, I agree with you. I mean, this is where I sort of differ with my friends who say, for example, you know, Goldman and Merrill were smarter, and and they were only hurt because of overnight funding. But but that's one of the risks you take. I agree with you, and. And it's a bad example to see people saved from that by by. Well, that's why they were able to make so much money, right? Yeah. That, that's the real problem. If you if you're going to say this world's a good world because you know you, you you take risk and you earn profit, but there's a chance you'll get losses if you don't have the loss side. Boy, yeah. Where, I, I, where are we going next? Yeah, I agree with you. I don't know. And and again, I'm getting out of my depth when I talk about the Fed, but I don't really understand what they're doing either. You're not alone. Okay. Uh, don't worry about that. Uh, let's uh, l let's talk a little bit about that that ethical issue. The way I think of it, uh, which is really not the way economists think about these things at all, but there's a certain there's a certain group think that that pardons ethical lapses in certain settings. You know, n nobody was was murdering people on Wall Street to make money. What they're doing was selling something that they maybe weren't so confident was what they said it was. And you say something in the book about the importance of transparency. Um, it's hard to be introspective about morality when it's sort of the norm of your culture and people around you to do what you're doing and to accept it as it is. It's a shame, but that's, I think, the way we are as human beings. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of things, there are a lot of things there are a lot of things that aren't acceptable now. So even from politically correct point, politically correct point of view, that were completely okay twenty or thirty years ago. So, so things do change. But um, I don't seem to. Do you think there's any evidence that they've changed or are changing on Wall Street? On Wall Street, 
I'm not close to, I sort of deal with people on the buy side, but I'm not really close to anybody in investment banks anymore. But I would say not. Um, I would say not. I mean, they got away with, with sort of metaphorical murder, and now it's back to business. Um, I don't see any real change. Yeah, obviously, um, if you don't let them suffer, they're they're not going to learn that lesson. But yeah, that's yeah, yeah. I think you're right. It's not so much punishment as just setting an example for the future. And if and you can have all the all the regulations in the world, but I think seeing people who did something that deserved to fail actually fail would have a much bigger effect. Yeah, well, there are people who argue. I'm not one of them, but there are people who argue that you know Wall Street as a whole it did pay a price. Uh, it's smaller. Um, a lot of people lost their jobs, um, but it looks to me at the higher levels where decisions were made, there wasn't – there was pain, but it was pain that was compensated for by other by other gains. So you know, people point to Richard Fold of Lehman or Jimmy Kane of Bear Stearns losing about a billion dollars on yeah, the stock. Yeah, but they were still left with 60 or 80 million. <laughs> 500 uh, Yeah, 500. Million. I don't yeah, know. No, so, they're, they're so, yeah, plenty. it's hard to feel sorry for them. I, I agree with you. People do point them out as examples, but I don't think it's a very good example. Yeah, I don't, I don't get that. Um, so what do you teach? I teach two courses, actually. I was teaching yesterday. Um, well, I, yeah, two courses. One is um, it's called sort of Introduction to the Volatility Smile, which is about models that go beyond black shoals that try to explain the nature of um, of option pricing in, in equity derivatives. And Black Scholes doesn't work quite right. Um, doesn't describe the way, the way, the way volatilities behave. So I teach one course on that. And another course, which, um, it's, it's, it's more like a discussion course where each week it's called important papers in quantitative finance or financial engineering. And each week we pick one paper, um, or one or two papers and, um, and, uh, the first couple of weeks, I make a presentation to give the students time to get up to speed, and then after that, they start making presentations in small groups of the rest of the class, and we discuss it. And actually, this year, I'm so I always did a lot of financial stuff, but actually, the last couple of years since the crisis, I'm trying to infiltrate some economics in there to educate myself. So, so we, we, we did one on the financial crisis last week, and read um, read. Uh, well, we use as a basis. There's a paper by Metric, um, two guys from Yale, Metric and somebody. Uh-huh. On a, uh, on a sort of a weekend's worth of reading to understand the, the sort of what happened in the financial crisis and various people's theories about it. And we're going to do, we did convertible bonds one week, which is more traditional stuff. And we're going to do something about the theory of money. So I'm trying to get some economics in there for my sake. So at, at the end of your book, you talk about the, the models have usefulness. They're not, they're not useless, but they have to be used with caution. How do you integrate that? into the classroom or more generally, what do you think young people going into finance should um, have in mind as they go forward, given that as when we were young, just like physics was very uh, seductive for you, I think we love when we're 19 and 23, we love certainty and we love equations and we love results and beauty. And if they're not quite right, we tend to just say, well, they're close enough and we keep going. Yeah, I try... Well, in the course I teach on options, which is really based on everything I ever worked on and did when I was on Wall Street or any papers I wrote, I really try hard to explain um, and to bring a lot of intuition into it to sort of, I use the mathematics, but I try hard to explain that all of these are just ways of trying to get a handle on how to price something. And that, in fact, what I like to say is, is that it's related to what you were saying about apartments, that the only reliable way to price something in finance, the only law of finance is if you want to know what something is worth, you have to find out how you can create a recipe to make it out of other things whose value you already know. So if you want to know what fruit salad is worth, you tell me what fruit is worth and tell me how to make fruit salad and I'll tell you what the fruit salad is worth. And I try to use that principle to to price options and exotic options and cap M and all kinds of stuff like that, all based on this fairly common sense principle that if you want to know what something's complicated is worth, figure out how to make it. And then I try to point out all the flaws in that as well. So I'm, I'm careful to try to stress, even before the crisis, to students that all of these are approximations, and when the world goes crazy um, and liquidity disappears, none of this is going to work very accurately. Do you think they listen? Um, 
Yeah, up to a point. I don't think I have fair success with this particular class. But in general, the general tendency, and I think I'm a little bit anomalous in the sense, the general tendency in our department and in almost all finance is to get more and more mathematical and less and less intuitive and less and less real world. And, and so I think that does tend to overwhelm them, although I try to, I try to combat it. It's and they're all out. They're all, they're all, um, in the end, they all want jobs, which is reasonable. Yeah. But it just, it reminds me of, um, I used to teach in a business school and I taught microeconomics and I taught it as a very intuitive, non-mathematical class. And one of my, one of my students uh, complained and she said, I wish it were harder. And I said, what do you mean by – I said, it's, I think it's incredibly hard. And, and, and she had struggled in the class. Yeah. She meant more, more equation, more calculus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> calculus is harder. Intuition, yeah. by definition, is easier. But to me, it's the other way around. Calculus is easy. You get real answers and you know what the right answer is. But intuition's trickier and art, more artful and harder. Yeah, it is. I mean, that's why I, I never want to come across – I agree with what you're saying. I never want to come across as saying finance is um, – I mean, I think finance is harder than physics, not easier than physics. Uh, yeah, um, I, I, I've actually got an email today. I'm sort of pleased. One student from our class last year is actually going to work for the SEC in their risk division. Uh huh. Just got a job there. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, unfortunately, just as Wall Street has its own incentive, so does the SEC. Hard to hard to stay pure in both places, I suspect. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to close with a question that I don't know if you can answer it, but. Um, I'm going to pretend it's a question of personal advice. Um, my oldest son is 17. He's uh, he's very good at math, and he's very good at hypothesis testing and using data to think about analytical questions. And five years ago, if you'd said six years ago, you'd say, "Well, you know, what what should he? Where should I encourage him to go study? And what to, what should he study?" One one of the things I would have thought about is finance. It's a natural thing for him. Finance is. Yeah. It's financially rewarding. It's got a, an intellectual aspect to it. Um, and I would have said, "What a that's a good life. But I'm not so sure anymore. Um, it seems to me there's a an aspect to it that is um, less noble, less pure, and, and a little bit um, tawdry, I'm afraid to say. A little bit what? Tawdry. Yeah. Um, dirty, uh, corrupt, that the links between Wall Street and Washington are not so healthy and Maybe the practitioners themselves are unaware of it, but as an outsider, it gives me the creeps, and I'm not sure I'd want my son in that world. He may go there anyway. I'm not, I can't sure. control him, but uh, I would. in the past, I might have encouraged him to think about it. Now I'm not so sure. Uh, do you think that's an unfair no, idea? No, I, I think it's fair. I mean, I, 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 look, I went into this field when I was 40, and, and I wanted a job too, and I wanted to do something interesting, and it, and it was, but, but I, I kind of agree with you a little. It's sort of changed. I've, I've become much more aware of all the, the sort of political ramifications or the sociological ramifications, you know, which go beyond just the math. Um, no, I think it's fair. Uh, I also think it's a bad idea for students to do the stuff as undergraduates, although we have that at Columbia. I think if you're going to do, I think it's better to spend your undergraduate career doing things that are, um, that are, um, not evanescent, and I think financial models are mostly evanescent and not very, very real. And um, I think it's better to do arts or science or physics or, or music or something as an undergraduate, and only do the stuff in graduate school if you're going to do it, and and then maybe first get a job for a couple of years in the in the in the industry to see how you like it and and to get a sense of what's important rather than imagining that what they teach in graduate school is what people do. <laughs> Well, that's good advice. I'll pass that along. <laughs> My guest today has been Emmanuel Derman. Emmanuel, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you very much. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.